everyone. Um, I'm Jenna Roll, uh, Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Welcome to our first Science Club from Home of 2022. We look forward to seeing you each month for another year of fascinating Science Club presentations on topics ranging from teeny tiny pollinators and plankton to big burly grizzly bears. So tonight, I am excited to introduce Dr. Milton Love. Dr. Love is a research biologist and ichthyologist at the Marine Science Institute at UC Santa Barbara. He has conducted research on the marine fishes of California for over 50 years, can you believe it? And is the author of over 120 publications on the fishes and invertebrates of the Pacific Coast. He has written such books as Certainly More Than You Want to Know About the Fishes of the Pacific Coast, A Guide to the Rock Fishes, Thorny Heads, and Scorpion Fishes of the Northeast Pacific, and the rock fishes of the Northeast Pacific. For over 15 years, using a manned research submersible, Dr. Love carried out surveys of the fish populations living around natural reefs and oil gas platforms throughout the Southern California bite. And in 2007, proving that you can fool at least some of the people all of the time, the American Fishery Society awarded Dr. Love the Carl R. Sel Sullivan Award for Conservation Resources. Hi there, Milton. Thank you for joining hey. us this evening. Please, when you're ready, take us away. All right, okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, talk to you about, uh, just briefly about the, the results of over 20 years of research, looking at the role that fishes may or may not uh, uh, play around uh, oil platforms off California. Um, first, I'm gonna just talk about platforms a little bit and then take a step back and give you some context for why uh, I got funded to do this research. So there are 27 platforms off California. To give you a frame of reference, there are thousands of platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So we don't really have very many. Um, platforms are all built the same way off California. They're all made out of steel. The steel framework uh, below the, the sea surface is called the jacket. Jackets uh, all look the same. You have uh, vertical pilings uh, um, and then horizontal uh, cross beams. Uh, platforms off California range in depth from uh, shallow ones off Huntington Beach, uh, maybe 30 or 40 feet deep, to uh, very large ones. Some of the largest uh, and deepest platforms in the world, um, the one that's over 1,300 feet uh, off of uh, Gaviona and is owned by uh, Exxon Mobil. Um, so to pull back a little bit and to, and to try to give you some context about why um, I ever got funded uh, to do this work. Uh, the question of what to do with platforms uh, when they become uneconomical to operate uh, it, it is an emotionally laden uh, question, certainly in California. Not so much in the Gulf of Mexico, but certainly off California. People have very strong views uh, about this. Some people feel that uh, the oil industry uh, uh, is inherently a, a polluting industry, that uh, platforms are inherently polluting structures. Uh, some people feel that artificial structure in the ocean uh, in, in the first place is, is not a good thing. And, and therefore uh, that platforms should be taken out once they're uh, uneconomical to operate. Uh, other people feel that platforms are uh, fully functioning reefs and, and question why one would remove them. Uh, there are many uh, decommissioning options uh, but if you want to put them into three broad categories, um, they are these. First of all, in theory, you can leave a platform in place. That's almost never been done. Uh, a couple of them in Asia, and that's just about it. The, the major issue, one of the major issues, is that it's very expensive to maintain a platform. Uh, you have to uh, make sure that you put uh, large zinc plates on the platform so that the zinc rusts away before the plat platform steel does. Uh, there's all sorts of navigational aids you have to put on a platform so that ships don't run into it. And uh, those can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So when people talk about, well, we can leave a platform in place and put a, a wind turbine up or mm, put a restaurant up or whatever, uh, you have to uh, uh, deal with the, the expense of just maintaining the platform. So that's almost never done. Um, the other two options in broad terms are you can cut a platform below the waterline and off California, when we're talking about uh, decommissioning, what to do with a platform, 
that is one of the two options that's usually brought up. And usually we talk about uh, maybe 85 or 90 feet below the waterline, you, you cut the jacket. And the reason that that, uh, that number is usually used is that the Coast Guard gets to weigh in on navigational hazards. And they feel that a platform that is cut that far below the waterline is not going to be a navigational hazard. And therefore, you don't have to put a buoy on it or in other, way, uh, in other ways mark it. So that's the second way, is basically to cut it below the waterline. The third way is to completely remove it. Um, that's what's uh, done for most platforms in the world, not all of them. Uh, uh, some platforms, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, are, they're, they're, are, are kind of decommissioned in, in a variety of those kind of cut them below the waterline ways. If you wanna re totally remove a platform, there are two ways of doing it. In theory, you can cut, you can have divers go down and cut the legs and then lift the, um, the jacket, put it on a barge and, and haul it away. Uh, that's expensive and it's dangerous. It, so it's not done very often, but in theory, you can do it. Far more often is you can uh, lower charges down uh, the, the legs, which are hollow, uh, below the mud line, below the seafloor, and then blow them up. And therefore you sever the, the, uh, the jacket. Uh, if you do it that way, uh, the potential downside, or maybe it's not depending on your philosophy, the potential downside is that you kill all the fish from the concussion, and then when you put the, the uh, jacket on a barge, it kills all the, the sea life that's, uh, that's attached. So that's kind of uh, talking about decommissioning options. Now, why was I funded? Well, um, back in, uh, I, I, I have been on soft money uh, my whole life, which means that at the university, if I don't bring in uh, contacts and grants, I can't uh, pay myself and I can't pay anybody in my lab. So uh, uh, about 1995, I was going through a, a bad period when I had no funding. And uh, the uh, manager of the uh, biology department came into my office and without talking to me, started measuring the office and then walked out. So that's not a good sign, kids. That's a, that's a bad sign. So one day I was sitting there in, in a, a mild stupor as I, is my want, and uh, I get a call. And the guy says, uh, this is Lyman Thorsonson from the National Biological Survey, which is a federal uh, agency. And um, he said, if you had money for marine research, what would you do? And that's a bizarre call because in my part, part of the business, people don't come to you with money, you go to them and beg money. It's a very, it's like a Dickensian kind of thing. The little beggar boy who, who goes and says, Oh, please, sir, could I have a quarter of a million dollars, sir? Please, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's no offering you money. So I said, who is this? And he said, repeated himself. And, he, and I said, well, uh, I'm interested in, in looking at the role that oil platforms uh, play as, as fish habitat. Uh, I've done some early research and it looks like there are fishes around them, but I don't know how important they are. He said, how would you do that? I said, well, uh, we'd use scuba divers for the first hundred feet and then, and then I said, how much money have you got? And he said, oh, I can't tell you that. I said, okay. And, and I said, well, for the, the lower parts, because the lower parts are below scuba depth, we'd use a two-person submarine. And he said, oh, that's expensive. And I said, well, it's about 7,000 a day. And he said, oh, that's not very expensive. And I thought, this dude has a lot of money. He is my new best friend. And that's how uh, we started. We started out with, um, with funding. Here, here's the funding sources, funding uh, from the uh, Biological Division of the U.S. Geological Survey. That was uh, um, Lyman's organization, uh, the National Biological Survey. The, uh, they caught the attention, they were created by Clinton, they caught the attention of Republicans, and they, they hid, they changed their name and hid inside U.S. Geological Survey and were never found again. So they funded me for a while. And then on the left, the Minerals Management Service funded me for, for a, over a decade. And that was the bulk of my, my funding. And I, and, I, and I try to be transparent about this because again, the subject of decommissioning is so um, fraught that I always explain to everybody, where did the money come from? So the vast majority of the money came from the federal government. And then a little bit, maybe 10 or 15% came from the California Artificial Reef Enhancement Program, which um, was uh, totally paid for 
by Chevron. So basically, um, I, I got um, uh, some money through from Chevron, basically, um, that was uh, uh, given to care first and then and then to me. The, the good news uh, from my perspective is uh, all the surveys we did, and that's basically what we do, all the surveys are uh, videotaped. And so if people don't believe me, I can you know always sit them down and go like here, you, you count the damn fish uh, yourself. So so we'll get to the data in a moment, but but the, the other important thing to remember is, well, what is my role here? And, and basically, my role as a biologist is just to give you facts. That's all. It's not to say something is bad or something is good or something is better or something or it is just to give you facts. You paid for them. You are taxpayers, and everybody gets the same facts. And I don't really care philosophically where you come from. You could think that oil companies are inherently evil and you want all the platforms removed, fine with me. You can think that platforms are great big reefs and you want them retained, fine with me. That's, I just give the same facts to everybody. And by the way, these are actual facts. Uh, I'm given to understand that three or four years ago, al uh, alternative facts became popular. Uh, these are actually facts. Alternative facts are actually uh, lies. And uh, we don't go in for that kind of thing. So, um, but having said that, that's my role as a biologist. As, as a citizen, I can have my own opinion about what should be done with platforms. And my opinion has nothing to do with biology. Um, when you remove a platform, as I mentioned, you kill all the marine life that is uh, attached to the platform. We're talking millions of animals, sea stars and crabs and anemones and everything. And I just think that's immoral. I mean, basically, you're killing an animal for landing and living on a piece of steel instead of a rock. So that's like capital punishment for a bad career move, basically, which uh, uh, I just think is immoral. But that has nothing to do with the, the research I've done. So when we first started, uh, we had a series of questions. Um, what fishes live around platforms and over nearby natural reefs? And that's really important. Because if you don't know what, what fishes live around natural reefs, there's no frame of reference when you see fishes around, uh, around uh, platforms. And the other question, and this is one that, that uh, biologists have debated for, I don't know, 50 years probably, and that's production versus aggregation. So aggregation means you see a bunch of fish around a platform or around a, re a rocky reef. Um, where did they come from? If they just swam from someplace else, that reef or that platform just aggregated fish. It's not benefiting the system at all, right? You're just rearranging the deck chairs. On the other hand, if a platform or a natural reef is producing fish, there are more fish in the system, whatever the system is, Southern California, Santa Barbara Channel, California. There are more of them because that structure was there. And so the federal government was interested in knowing, well, are platforms producing fish or are they just aggregating them? So here's what a, a platform looks like uh, close up. It's got an inner tidal zone. Uh, the top 30 feet are uh, uh, off California. This is strictly California, are um, covered in, in mussels and the animals that associate with mussels. So um, there's a, a look, uh, uh, 30, 40 feet down. By the way, those, um, I think you can see my cursor. All of those structures, those are all the conductors. Uh, basically, the wells are attached to pipes and gas and oil flows uh, up these conductors and eventually uh, goes to shore through a pipeline. So uh, there's kind of a look at, at a kind of typical shallow uh, cross beams or, or, uh, or pilings uh, covered in uh, sea anemones and, and covered in in mussels. And then there's also animals associated with platforms. Um, uh, cormorants, we see cormorants. It's actually very strange if you're down in 150 feet of water and you're counting fish and a bird swims right by you. It's like just a trip, man. And then there's a lot of sea lions that also live uh, on the buoys around platforms and actually on the lower landings. They, um, they'll walk right up the stairway from the lower landing and the, the people on platforms have had to put in gates so that the, the um, sea lions don't climb up too high. So there's a look at 
some of the invertebrates. Uh, these are uh, strawberry, or I'm sorry, club anemones, the purple jabos, and lots of uh, mussels. And there's these uh, white anemones, vitridiums, uh, nudibranchs, all the kinds of uh, marine invertebrates that one would associate with with uh, with reefs. Sea anemone or sea uh, sea stars before um, that disease came through, and the, and almost all the sea stars of a certain of certain types died in uh, all up and down the coast from Alaska to Baja California. Um, uh, barnacles, and then when you get deeper, the mussels uh, uh, peter out. And you get a whole bunch of other animals. Um, this is the bottom of Platform Gale, which is located out by Anacapa Island in 700 odd feet of water. You start getting king crabs and, and uh, bigger sponges and, and bigger sea anemones and the like. So there's stratification by depth with, uh, with the invertebrates. And then at the round, around every platform, to a certain extent, there are shell mounds. And, there's, and, and these shells come from uh, up above, all, all of those mussels that are uh, living on the, the platforms, eventually they fall. They fall either in gales, which knock them off, or they fall because the uh, operators of platforms uh, clean the, uh, the legs off to reduce drag. So they'll, they'll clean them down to 30, 40, 50 feet. And all of those shells rain down and cover the seafloor, or at least form piles, in some cases, many feet thick. And then a whole group of organisms live on these, this kind of low-lying reef. These are, uh, this is again, I think a platform gale. These are all juvenile uh, rock crabs. They're all about the size of a silver dollar. And you get a lot of, in the good old days before all of these sea stars died, you get a, a lot of uh, sea stars living around them. Uh, some of them have spot prawns on them, a, a range of, of invertebrates. So um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the top 100 feet, we did um, scuba surveys. And we started in 95 and really did every year through 2011 and then kind of sporadically uh, after that. So we have a lot of data and we have a good idea of not just one year's worth of data, but uh, over a decade's worth of data about what lives fish-wise, what lives where and, and when. And then uh, much of the, the um, uh, results I'm going to show you today come from this two-person submarine. This is the Delta. Uh, basically, a pilot sits amidships right there. And then the uh, observer sits over here and looks out this port. So there's uh, the observer will sit uh, kind of hunched uncomfortably and look out this port. Uh, this is a video camera, so whatever uh, we see is uh, is videotaped, we have a microphone right next to our mouth and uh, two ruby lasers. So when uh, an observer looked out the window, they saw two red dots and the dots were 20 centimeters apart. And we did that to um, uh, kind of help train our eye because we had to estimate the length of every single fish. Not only did we try to identify the species every fish, we, we identified uh, or made an estimate of the length of every fish. And basically the rules were, we identified everything from our eye two meters out and from the sea floor two meters up. If a fish was four meters up, if a fish was three meters away, it did not exist. So we were able actually that way to do a densities of fishes instead of, instead of saying, we saw 23 um, green striped rockfish, we could actually say uh, the, the densities, which is a far more uh, powerful metric than, than mere numbers. So that gives you an idea, a frame of reference. There's the Delta right there and platform off of uh, Summerlin. And that's a schematic of what we did. We basically, uh, uh, the pilot and observer went down uh, a leg and then went out about oh, 30 feet or so from the, the jacket uh, and did a shell mount transect. So we were interested in what fishes lived around the shell mounds. So we went all the way around uh, identifying the fish. And then we went up right to the platform. There's a, always a cross beam at the bottom. It went all the way around the first cross beam, identifying the fish, went up to the second cross beam, third cross beam, and so forth. Here's all the platforms um, off California. The ones with stars are the ones that uh, we have surveyed uh, with the 
uh, either with uh, Scuba or with um, the Delta or with both. A uh, few platforms, we didn't do the ones uh, right down here off Long Beach. Um, Chris Lowe's group at Long Beach State did that. Uh, we actually did um, Gina with Scuba, but it's too shallow to do with a sub. And Heritage, we never, we never got permission to do actually. And uh, so this basically gives you an idea through at least 2009 where we went. Every one of these dots is a dive we made, uh, in this case with the submersible. Uh, and you can see we did a lot of Southern California, all the way out to the edge of the continental shelf before it just drops out, just bombs off. And uh, again, this was so that we could get a frame of reference. So we go like, okay, here's what we see on a platform, and here's what the rest of Southern California looks like. Um, at the same time, as far as fishes are concerned. And that was a take home message. Not all platforms are created equal when you look at, at the fish populations, which one would expect. They're, they're in different depths and different parts of, the, of, the, uh, of Southern California. But if you were to hold a, a, a gun to my head and say, well, you gotta make generalities. You have to do that. Okay, so here's the generalities. First of all, um, there are a group of fishes that are just swimming through. Um, anchovies, sardines, uh, mackerel, yellowtail, things like that. Uh, they don't care if the platform is there. They're, they may hang around for a little while, but then they're gone. They are not platform uh, dependent. And then you have in the shallower parts of the platform, very typical reef fishes, the same species that you see on, on natural reefs in the same depth. So uh, fishes like Garibaldi, one of my favorite pictures, the picture of a sheephead. <clears throat> uh, you even find uh, uh, sig signathids, little pipe fishes. Um, there's a cabazon, the male cabazon guarding a, a, an egg nest at a platform. And um, of, of what turned out to be primary importance, but we didn't realize how important it was for a while, uh, platforms tend to be nursery grounds for a, a group of fishes, not all fishes by any means, but for a group of fishes, mainly rock fishes. Rock fishes are, are the dominant group of fishes in uh, California, particularly in, in hard bottom areas. And it's not surprising that, that uh, if anything was gonna be a, a nursery ground uh, for anything, it would be for, for rock fishes. So there's a suite of about a dozen uh, economically important rock fishes uh, that uh, use the platforms as nursery ground. They also use uh, natural reefs. So this is an example, this is, uh, platform uh, Gilda, and these are baby Boccaccio. We will come back and talk about Boccaccio ad nauseum. Boccaccio are, are a uh, kind of rockfish that is economically important and was declared overfished by the federal government, uh, oh, 20 years ago or more. So that's kind of the, the midwaters of the platform. The bottom tends to have a different uh, assemblage of, of fishes, uh, either subadult or adult fishes. Uh, and they tend to be of deeper water uh, species. These are either vermilion or sunset rock fishes called red snapper by, by fishermen. We call this place Candy Cane Lane because every time we came by it, this is one side of platform uh, Grace, uh, we saw all these flag rock fish. In deeper water, these are adult Boccaccio. The highest densities of adult Boccaccio we've seen anywhere in Southern California were at this one platform, uh, platform uh, Gale. And uh, there's a cow cod. Cow cod was overfished to within about, I think, 3% of its unfished level. I have actually a tattoo of a cow cod on my arm. It's, uh, it's uh, my totemic uh, fish, probably. I love cow cod. And again, the highest densities that we've ever seen in Southern California were at uh, Platform Gale. And then around the shell mound, you have uh, fishes that are actually related and similar to the ones around the bottom of the platform, but they tend to be uh, smaller and they tend to be juvenile. So these are half-banded rockfish, big schools, thousands and thousands of half-bandeds over the, the shells. This is a baby cow cod. I mean, it's like, how big is it? I'm using my fingers. It's about four inches long. And when it gets bigger, it probably swims over to the, to the bottom of the platform and, and lives there. And uh, ju just to let you know, the, the, the pipeline that carry the oil and gas also serves as habitat, uh, not just the shell mounds, not just the, the platforms, and, and is usually covered in um, uh, invertebrates and, and has fishes associated with it. 
So if you um, compare platforms and reef fish assemblages, which is one of the things we were uh, supposed to do, I'm not gonna go into, into heavy detail at all. And by the way, anyone who wants more information, uh, I've got lots of papers that I can send people. Email me and I'll just start out, I'll send you one kind of overview paper. All of these are in refereed journals. And uh, you know, if, if you want all 30 reports and papers that, you know, if you've got the time, I got the, I got the PDFs. So uh, this is just to give you an idea of, uh, if you look at, at Boccaccio, and we'll be looking at this over and over again, kind of the poster child for an overfished species. So um, to, to, give, to give you a frame of reference, every one of those uh, uh, symbols was a dive from uh, the sub where we counted fish. And um, the, the warmer the color, the higher the density of, in this case, adult Boccaccio were. And you can see uh, this is back in the bad days when the Boccaccio population was, was really in the toilet. Um, they come back kind of. Um, and you can see there's a lot of X's all over the place. And X's means we didn't see a single adult Boccaccio in habitat where they should have been. And that, that's purely an overfishing phenomenon. And it's not just commercial fishing, it was also recreational fishing. Uh, between the two of them, they just knocked the population for a loop. And you can see that the highest densities we saw were at platform uh, Gale, another, uh, and that's a natural reef out there where it's windy, people don't fish as much. Same thing uh, up there, platform and a natural reef uh, right there. What I do wanna show you uh, uh, in, in, in a little more detail is this whole nursery function. I said platforms can serve as nursery grounds. They don't all serve as nursery grounds for fishes, but, but most of them do. What I wanna do is, is show you a multi-year survey where we looked at the uh, young of the year rockfish that live at this platform. So here's conception, we're down here, and here's Arguello, and there's Central California. So there's Hidalgo and North Reef, okay? We always surveyed those two structures the same day. So there was nothing different about seasonality. And they're in about the same depth. That's great. Uh, there's not real difference in depth. And they're in the same water mass. So we held a lot of things constant. OK, so just to, to, to frame this for you, um, this is density of, in this case, just young of the year fishes. These are baby rock fishes. The higher the bar, the more of them there were. The blue bars is the platform and the red bar represents the nearby reef and, and years go along here, okay? The first thing you can see is that no matter what you're looking at, platform or reef, there's a lot of variability between years. And that makes complete sense because every year is not a good year for young fishes. They're drifting around the plankton. In some years, very few of them survive. In other years, a lot of them survive. It's, it's totally natural you would see this variability between years. The other thing is you notice that the blue bar is always higher than the red bar. And, and what that means is there was always a higher density of, of little rock fishes at the platform than nearby natural reef. And the reason for that is probably not because the oil industry uh, uh, shakes pixie dust on a platform. That, that is highly unlikely. The likely reason is a platform covers the entire water column. And North Reef is only about 12 feet tall. So if you're a little rockfish 50 feet below the surface and you're drifting around and you're looking for something to settle out on and you do not care if it's a piece of steel, if it's a, a spare tire or if it's a rock reef, who are you more likely to encounter? Well, the platform, the platform covers the entire water column. And that's the reason that in general, almost always platforms have higher densities of little rock fishes than do nearby natural reefs. It's just opportunity that is causing that. So here's a, here's a, a, a year where the baby Boccaccio uh, did very well out in the water column. And this is platform Gilda, which is kind of off Ventura. And uh, it was loaded with baby Boccaccio. And um, for many years, what I would do is I would just report, uh, here's the densities of these baby Boccaccio. But there were so many that year that I actually said to myself, well, how many are we talking about? Can we estimate the numbers of these baby fish around the platform? So um, uh, we, we actually did. We, we tried to figure out, well, what's the volume of the platform? And, uh, 
and uh, you know how, how many cross beams were there and, and, and so forth. And what we wound up with, I only had enough money to look at uh, uh, seven platforms that year. And uh, he, here's the actual numbers we came up with uh, all the way from in round numbers, 350,000, just of this one species of these babies uh, down to zero. So it, it totaled about 430,000 of these babies in, in a year. Now, to me, that sounded important that in that particular year, not every year, folks, but in that particular year for that particular species, there was a hell of a lot of baby ones. But the question is, well, is that important to the species as a whole? The species ranges from Baja, California to British Columbia. So I asked, um, I asked the guy who's uh, in charge of the stock assessment for Boccaccio, the federal stock assessment uh, for Boccaccio. I said, is this number uh, important? And he cranks it through his, uh, his, his program. And he said, uh, yeah, he said in that year, uh, those six platforms, uh, that was about 20% of the yearly average baby Boccaccio abundance for the entire Pacific Coast. I thought, wow. I said, but the, the real key is how many adults does it turn into? Because if it, if it only turned into like five adults, because they all died on average, well, that's not very important. So I said, well, uh, you know, how many adults does that turn into? And he said, okay, he's got another program for that. And he said, in that one year, those six platforms contributed about 1% of the additional amount of Boccaccio needed to rebuild the stock. So that's important. That, that was important. Now, is that true for all fish? No. Is it true for all years? No. Is it true for all platforms? No. And this is what I got. This is, uh, he, here's an example of how uh, a platform could be important in rebuilding at least one fish population. Okay, so here I am talking about, here, that's me over here, you can recognize the hair. Uh, here I am talking uh, about my, the research, uh, you, you know, the, my data to, uh, these I think are all CEOs of ma major oil companies. I think that's the CEO of ExxonMobil, I think. Seems very interested. And, and obviously uh, the oil industry uh, was were very excited because uh, you know it, it sounds good to them. On the other hand, uh, here I am. You can again recognize me by the long hair. Uh, talking to uh, members of uh, environmental organizations, and uh, they weren't as excited. I, I do find, I must say, uh, parenthetically, that um, I find it ironic that uh, you know, again, to be transparent, I kind of walk on the far left environmental side of the street. And uh, the, the people I would have considered my natural allies have never evoked uh, any interest in, in my, the results. I mean, uh, with one exception in 1997, no environmental group, kind of my natural allies, I would have thought, uh, has ever asked me to give like a talk. And, um, and in fact, uh, one person, well, two, uh, members of environmental organizations have gone around the state at one time or another uh, saying I was a liar because I was uh, paid, my research was paid for by the, by the oil industry. I actually, my, my accountant who lives in LA many years ago, he called me at about 7.30 in the morning and he said, there's somebody saying bad things about you on, on television. I said, oh yeah, yeah, well, that's this person's job. This person's job is to, um, uh, to be against uh, decommissioning a, a, a platform in place, uh, that person's job is to, 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 uh, to say that removal is the best thing. And so um, their job is to cast aspersions on my character, basically. So um, uh, not just these folks, but, but in the academic community, after the first six or eight years, uh, I began getting uh, pushback from people. And uh, what I want to talk about now is kind of how I uh, responded again to the, to the questions, uh, the good questions that came up uh, about my research. So uh, the first one was uh, going back to 2003, there are all those uh, Boccaccio and, and people were going like, well, uh, you, you handed the data over to a guy at NIMFS and, and uh, he, he made the assumption that it was an average year for baby Boccaccio, but maybe in that particular year, it was a great year for baby Boccaccio everywhere. 
on natural reefs and on platforms, in which case the, the model uh, doesn't hold up. So fortunately for me, I actually know a lot of people who do all kinds of scuba surveys and, and they looked at um, reefs that should have a baby Boccaccio on them. And uh, I asked them just to give me some uh, density estimates. And you can see that in general, nobody saw any. Uh, there were some exceptions and uh, uh, particularly around the Channel Islands, but, but nothing like these big numbers that you, that you see at the platforms. So at least for this year, and, and again, all I got is this year. I'm not saying every year is like this for every fish, right? You know, this is a litany, I gotta tell you. Um, for at least for this year, there were not a lot of baby Boccaccios everywhere. You fool, maybe they all die. Okay, so, so this is good. So um, back around 98, uh, I was at a, a, a symposium and my friend Mark Carr, who I think was a grad student at the time and now is a professor at UC Santa Cruz, I was going like, Mark, we just got back from this cruise uh, and uh, the platforms off of uh, Arguello, uh, Hermosa Hidalgo, and uh, I've all of a sudden lost its name. Um, there was a lot of, of baby widow rockfish. I, there may have been hundreds of thousands. You know, I, I think those platforms may be producing uh, rockfish. And he said, how do you know they don't all die the next day? And, you know, being a good scientist, I looked at him and I said, screw you, Mark. And uh, actually, I didn't say that. That's the R-rated version of what I actually said. And, uh, but then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, how, how can you answer that question? The, you fool, maybe they all, these babies all die. And it turned out that nature provided, um, provided one way of doing it. So it's a complicated figure, I will admit, but go with me here. We're just looking at Boccaccio, again, our old favorite Boccaccio. And this is one platform, platform Gale, which sits in about 700 odd feet of water. And this is data from uh, our submersible surveys, where remember we went all up and down that platform and we counted fish and identified. Okay, and here are years, 97, 99, 2000. Okay, you got that? Got that part? Each one of these laterals is a year. Each one of these little bars describes the density of Boccaccio at a particular size, okay? Fishes around this big, those are the babies, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters. So you see in 97, no babies. 99, pretty good numbers of babies, okay? We came back the next year, fishes that should be one year older, those are those right there. Came back the next year, not a lot of small ones, but slightly bigger ones. Came back the next year, a lot of ones that are bigger. And I drew a line there to just kind of show you the mean size. So right here, came back in four, and the size frequency of this, these are, this is probably what is called a year class. Basically, we were following a bunch of fish. The most likely thing is we're following a bunch of fish all the way here. And then the size didn't get much bigger between three and four. So like what's going on there? Well, what happens with fish, when they mature, they shift energy from growth to production of sperm and eggs. And this is about the age when Boccaccio should be maturing right there. So the most likely, there are other explanations that are just unlikely, but possible. The most likely explanation is that these fish here they didn't die. I mean, some of them obviously died, but uh, a lot of them did not die. Uh, and they became one-year-olds, two-years old, four-years. And then they actually started um, reproducing. And you can see the same phenomenon starting to go on here again. Now, again, does this happen for Boccaccio at all platforms? Absolutely not. Does it happen for other species of fish? I don't know. This is the data I, I have. Maybe they're all stunted. Okay, so you got in some years, hundreds of thousands of these baby fish, not just rockfish, but other fish. And they're, they're not eating stuff off the, the pilings or the cross beams, they're eating plankton. They're eating stuff that's drifting through. So in theory, if you have 
whatever, 300,000 little fish all picking plankton, there may not be enough plankton to sustain them. So when you get these huge numbers of babies at a platform, maybe their growth rates are actually less than at a, a natural reef where there are fewer of the babies, right? There's less competition. So what we did was we took, um, we collected uh, baby blue rockfish. These are again, young of the year at two platforms right there and two fairly nearby natural reefs. And the higher the bar, the faster their growth rate. And we, we uh, estimated their growth rate by taking their ear bones out and they lay down a ring every single day. We can actually tell how many days old a fish is by counting the rings. And if you know the length of the fish, you know how fast it grew. And so you could actually develop a growth curve. And what we found was that the, at the two platforms, growth was very slightly greater than at uh, the natural reefs. Not, I don't think that's enough to make any difference, but what it showed was that, <laughs> again, for this species at this year, at these two platforms, they weren't stunted. Now, uh, is this true all the time? I have no idea. If someone wanted to give me some more money, I, I could partially answer that question. Maybe if the platform were not there, all the little Boccaccio would recruit to natural reefs. That's a really good, that's a really good question. So the, 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 the thought there is you got this platform, you go out there in, in September, and there's all these little Boccaccio and little widows and little um, blue rockfish, there's all these little fish. And they all came out of the plankton around June or July. What if that platform had not been there and the, the little fish had just drifted uh, by or, or through because the platform wasn't there? Would they have all wound up at natural reefs? And, and if that was true, then the platform wasn't very useful, right? The natural reefs would have been just as good. So how do you do that? So you can model that. Uh, UCSB has what's called CODAR stations. So CODAR basically is radar that is aimed at the ocean and it can actually follow surface currents around continually, 24 hours a day, year after year after year. Uh, when we did this study, they, uh, the CODAR that UCSB had covered this area and uh, we used platform Irene. And we platform, you go out to platform arena and in some years there are uh, lots of little Boccaccio and lots of little other rockfishes. And we ask the question, what would happen if you remove platform Irene to little fishes that were drifting around and encountered Irene? And so you can actually put in the computer model little pretend fish that are drifting around. So there you go. There are a whole bunch of little pretend fish and these, these are based on current patterns. These aren't, um, th these little squiggly things are not based on something that we invented. These are actual current patterns. So, okay, you have all of it and you can do a million of them if you want. And so basically we played a little game. We basically said, okay, you get all of these. We only are talking about the little pretend rockfish that went right through Irene. And then we removed Irene and asked the question, well, where did they go after that? Okay, instead of stopping here, they went someplace else. And the rules were, if they went inshore, where there are natural reefs that, that are nursery grounds, then they survived. If they went offshore, then they died, which is true, that's what would happen. And we did that three years running, and we did it only during the time of the year when little baby uh, Boccaccio in this case, we're out there. We didn't pick the middle of winter. It was, it was springtime. And what we found was that on average, 73% of the little babies that would have hit Irene, they, they wound up going offshore. They would have died. Now, again, is that true for every platform in every year? Absolutely not. I have no idea what happens with other platforms. This is, uh, we had CODAR information for that, uh, that time period. So that's, that's what we used. Maybe when young Boccaccio leave a platform, they all die a terrible, terrible death. Okay, so, and this is true for other rockfish, but Boccaccio are good because if you go out to um, ABC Hill House, if you go out to the, the, the um, platforms that are right off Summerlin, about four more miles out, 
In many years, they're a bunch of little baby Boccaccio. They don't stay there. They stay there about a year and then they swim away. They go someplace else. So how do you know when they leave the platform and go someplace else, they don't all die. They, they never make it to a natural reef. Well, fortunately for me, California Department of Fish and Game, now Fish and Wildlife, they tagged a whole bunch of these little baby Boccaccio. They actually caught them, put a tag in their backs, threw them back in the water, and then hoped that somebody else would catch them. And people did, and um, years and years later, and uh, as adults. So they found that uh, some uh, went uh, north, some went all the way south, some crossed. Uh, what that tells you is that at least some of the Boccaccio that leave the platform, the, uh, they don't automatically die. They survive to become uh, adults. So here's another um, uh, fear, valid fear. Maybe they glow in the dark. Okay, so we're talking about fishes in general around platforms. So platforms are not like cotton candy factories, right? Plat these are industrial facilities. They... Uh, uh, when they, they drill um, wells, the, uh, the bits are lubricated uh, with uh, drilling muds that used to have very high levels of cadmium and other heavy metals. Now they have less, but they still have pollutants. Those drilling muds are usually uh, deposited on the seafloor. Um, some platforms, when they pull up oil and gas, there's water associated with um, the oil and gas. Uh, produced water, it's called, and in some cases, the water is just released into the ocean, though that um, produced water can have pollutants. So one might expect that uh, fishes that live around platforms may be more polluted, particularly with, with um, heavy metals, than uh, the same species that are not near a platform. So um, I got funding uh, from the Minerals Management Service to collect uh, fishes around platforms and natural reefs, same species, and then to send them to a, a federal lab in uh, Missouri, and they actually analyze them for um, heavy metals. And so there's the five groups of platforms with the associated uh, natural sites. Um, and basically what we found, I guess I don't have that slide. What we found is there was no difference. There was no statistical difference in the amount of uh, pollutants between um, uh, kelp rockfish, for instance, or Pacific sand dabs that live at a platform with um, the same species that live uh, away from the platform on uh, natural sites. The last thing I, I wanna talk about um, before we kind of summarize is a, a, a study that Jeremy Clace, my associate at, at uh, Cal Poly Pomona did. And, and he looked at um, what's called fish production. Uh, production, and it doesn't have to be fish, um, it can be invertebrate production, it can be plankton production. It's a metric that's used to compare the, um, well, the value, if you will, of habitats. And usually it's in the context of, well, what's um, uh, plankton production in a, an estuary versus the open ocean? And uh, the production is always, almost always higher in an estuary than the open ocean. Or what's uh, production of, uh, fishes in a, a temperate reef versus a coral reef. And usually coral reefs have higher production. So it's a, it's a metric that's used all, all over the world, um, not just in, 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 uh, in the ocean, but in, in other systems. So Jeremy uh, said, you know, you have all of these fish living around a platform. Why don't we look at the productivity of these platforms as far as fish are concerned? And so he looked at, I can't even remember, he looked at a, a number of platforms. And uh, basically, the higher this, this uh, vertical structure, the higher the fish production at, these are all platforms combined. And you can see that, that some didn't have really high production, some had really high production. But here's a comparison to uh, coral reefs, to estuaries, artificial reefs. Um, and these were the highest uh, that he could find in the literature. And when you compare what he derived from our platforms, uh, it was the highest in the world. Uh, 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 even the lowest productivity of one of our platforms was higher than any other uh, marina or estuarine system. Um, why is that? Again, it's not because they're magical places. Basically, productivity is ask, asking the question, 
how fast are the organism packing um, carbon on? Uh, essentially growth rates. Well, the, the platforms have uh, in some years really high numbers of these baby fish that are growing really, really fast. They're really packing carbon on. So it's a, it just turns out to be a function of Pacific Coast platforms that they have a lot of babies that are growing fast. There's nothing magical. Um, interestingly, you cannot say the same thing about Gulf of Mexico platforms, where again, there's like whatever, 3,000 of them. They don't have all these babies around them. So they're not functioning the same way. It's just chance that uh, 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 allows the platforms off California to be uh, so productive when it comes to fishes. So um, here's um, little summary slides. First of all, in broad terms, there are two fish assemblages around most California platforms. One in the midwaters, which tends to be either um, kind of natural, typical natural reef shallow species or um, young fishes, and the other around the platform base and the associated shell mound, which tends to be uh, older, um, uh, more mature fishes. Water column within many platforms serve as rockfish nursery grounds. Uh, young of the year rockfish densities around many platforms are greater than those uh, on most natural reefs in Southern California. Not always, but that's by and large true. Some platforms act as de facto marine reserves. That's actually uh, something I didn't touch on. One of the reasons that you tend to get higher densities of large fish around most platforms is that there's very little fishing that goes on uh, around the platforms. Um, this is not true, by the way, the ones off um, Long Beach, where the, there's just been a long history of little boats coming out, out or even sport fishing boats and fishing near platforms. But every place else, the uh, companies that run the platforms, they get really squirrely when a, a little boat that they don't know comes over near them and uh, just kind of hangs out, they'll call the Coast Guard on you. So, um, and then the people who fish on platforms, uh, who, who work on platforms, um, they do a little fishing, but not a lot. I actually talked to one guy one time years ago who worked out at Platform Gale. And I said, do you guys do much fishing out there? And he said, uh, he said well, yeah, when you first go out on platform, you fish a little bit, but you know, after a while, all you want when you get off shift is a dove bar. And I said, uh, oh, okay. He said, yeah, now that Veneco uh, runs the platform, we don't get dove bars anymore. And I, I thought, oh, well, bummer. He said, I don't like the apples either. It used to be uh, Fuji's and now all we get are gale. And I'm going like to myself, like, well, what is my role here? Is this like some sort of labor thing? Or is this like, like a, are we gonna sing a labor song? I can probably sing Joe Hill. If you remind me of the lyrics, I, I probably could. I say, I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. I can actually do that. I thought, okay, uh, why don't we sing labor song? But then he went off and talked about something else. But anyway, so platforms tend to be uh, de facto uh, marine reserves. As with uh, natural reef platforms, both produce and aggregate fishes. And, and that's the key thing. Uh, virtually every natural reef probably produces and aggregates fish and platforms do too. And if you came up to me and said, the most important thing to me in life are kelp bass. Uh, are platforms important for kelp bass? I go like, nope. Uh, some platforms have kelp bass, but not very important. If you said, most important thing to me is uh, uh, little, you know, uh, rockfish populations. I go like, well, yeah, a lot of platforms uh, are probably producing rockfish. They're adding to the population. Just depends on what you want. And by the way, again, let me reinforce the idea that if you're the kind of person who just philosophically is opposed to artificial stuff in the ocean or is philosophically opposed to uh, leaving any part of a platform in place because you're rewarding the oil industry, that is fine. And, and none of this, none, nothing I've said today makes any difference because um, you, you have a philosophical standpoint that is just as valid as any other one, right? And uh, platforms may be regionally uh, important in enhancing uh, fish populations. And then on average, uh, fishes living around platforms are neither um, uh, more nor less contaminated than fishes living around natural sites. And then lastly, uh, 
California oil and gas platforms are most the mo among the most productive uh, marine fish habitats uh, in the world. That's it. I have no idea if anybody's still there. This is absolutely trippy. I could have been talking to myself the whole time, but I enjoyed it. So like, who the hell cares, right? It's all good. Here. Oh no, you're there. That's good. <laughs> but there are also a lot of other people here oh, okay. as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you can lie to me. It's fine. How would I know? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Oh, great. I have some questions for you. Are sure, you ready? Sure, I have some answers for you. Awesome. Kate wants to know, uh, sea level has risen approximately 400 feet in the last approximately 20,000 years. Can you speak to what the marine life might have been like, abundance and diversity in the channel and the effect of rising sea level on marine life, particu particularly from 13,000 years ago to present when Chumash culture became present? With clarification to the question that uh, they ask because the comparison of marine life on platforms to natural reefs seems like it could give insights into marine life in different water depths. Yeah, well, I mean, that is a great question. I actually just wrote a paper, I mean, in draft form that, that actually talked about that, that, that what we see now is nothing like the way it was um, during the, the uh, glaciation period when sea level was three or 400 feet lower. And at that point, if you think about it, the channel was almost closed off. It wasn't, but it was almost closed off. There was uh, the, the carbonate reefs in the center of the channel that are called the Calafi or the 12 mile reef, they were little islands. So there was actually little islands out there. Um, uh, the, um, the water depth, I mean, the, the, the amount of deep water uh, creatures was very small because there was almost no deep water out in the, uh, out in the channel. I mean, there was a huge uh, amount of difference. Um, and of course, uh, we don't actually know when Chumash and, and their, their ancestors came to California, um, but it was at least 12, 13,000 years. It may have been more. Um, there, there's a Daisy Cave out in San Miguel is, is that old. And that meant that people had to, you know, have watercraft to get out there. And um, so the, the amount of shallow water was, was much, the amount of dry land for that matter was much greater. The amount of shallow water uh, was much greater. Um, there are actually tar volcanoes uh, out in the middle of the channel that are now in um, 300 odd meters of water. And they were probably right up near the surface. You had these tar oozing up 20,000 uh, years ago, right up at the surface. So there's been a, 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 a huge difference in, in what, um, what lives there now. Uh, what lessons you can learn from looking at, at platforms, I don't know. I mean, one of the problems is that when we go, when you go diving now, or we take the submarine now and we look, it's not a natural system we're looking at. We're looking at a badly perturbated system, perturbated primarily by, by fishing, by cropping uh, large fishes out. So um, when we go down, we meaning everybody in my lab, but every time I say we, it's not the royal we. Well, it could be the royal we, but it's not. Um, go down in our sub, uh, you know, into 150, 200 feet of water, and there's all these little small dwarf species of fish. We're going like, okay, well, this is the way it always looked. Well, it may not have looked that way. Uh, uh, 500, 800, 1,000, 10,000 years ago, before there was extensive fishing, there may have been an, a lot of big fish and very few small fish. So it's very hard to, to actually uh, uh, hindcast on what lived on, on these reefs because we don't have a frame of reference. All I do know is that my friend, Mary Yaklovich, who was with the National Marine Fisheries Service, she invited me to go out in uh, Monterey Bay uh, and, and in a, on sub cruises. And we hit a spot that was in 450 feet of water on the edge of one of the canyons. It had never been fished, ever. It's, it's, you run a fathometer over it uh, on a boat and you can't see it because it's on a vertical, face and nobody had ever fished there and every fish was maximum size i was incoherent when i came up out of the sub i i've never seen a place like that and there may not be another place like that and that's what much of california deep water may have looked like that's the only evidence we have very different than uh what we see now that didn't answer the question but it was every whatever question i answered was a lot of fun to answer Great. <laughs> Perfect. 
Um, Alexandra wants to know um, if the fish rely on plankton for food, which isn't related to the platforms, what advantage do they get by hanging out at the platforms? So there may be several advantages. The first thing is a lot of a lot of fish are just attracted to stuff. And I mean, and genetically, you can take a uh, tire and go out into Goleta Bay here in like whatever, 100 feet of water, and you throw the tire overboard and hits a muddy bottom. Not a lot of fish down there, some, but not a lot. And you come back in a month and a half and you dive down and there'll be four brown rock fish that are like just staring at the tire. And they're not living in the tire necessarily. They're just looking at the tire. And, and in, in that case, they don't care what it is. The, these are animals that there's been selection for being associated with structure. And, and you can hypothesize that it reduces uh, uh, predation risk. Um, that's probably the, the major thing is it, produce, it reduces predation risk. And it's the same thing for platforms. These are animals, the animals you find living on platforms, the fishes, are ones that are genetically programmed to associate with structure. And a platform is a whole lot of structure. And um, even uh, uh, older, uh, as an example, a widow rockfish, uh, a, a widow rockfish that's a foot and a half, two feet long, it still eats gelatinous zooplankton, but it still associates with hard stuff. So uh, the other thing is that in many cases, the fish at night, they will tuck in uh, uh, into caves and crevices and they sleep, or they certainly look like they're asleep at night. So it, it adds a layer of, of uh, protection uh, at night. Awesome, thank you. Uh, wow, we have so many great questions. It's really hard to choose. Um, Robin wants to know, isn't high productivity of California platforms a function of greater surface area for fish to hang out? Um, that's, that, that's an aspect of it. The, the greater uh, the surface area, the more animals that can associate with the, the platform. Um, however, if you can hypothesize a huge natural reef, massive, many, many football fields, but is only six feet tall and is in 400 feet of water, it would not have the same level of productivity as a platform because the platform, in, in, in the shallow parts of that platform are the ones that are the most productive. So yes, the, the answer is yes, that's part of it, but it's not the whole story. Great. Um, Hunter wants to know, with oil and gas being phased out for more renewable energy sources, what can this research aid future offshore energy endeavors or any endeavors in general? Where can we go from here knowing that we know what we know about these platforms? Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, the, the, the usual, well, it depends on what kind of, of uh, renewable energy is going to occur off California. If, if we assume that the, 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 in the near future, near meaning let's say a decade from now, um, we're going to have uh, uh, wind energy, First of all, it's not gonna be the channel, be, probably because there's not enough wind. It'll be up north, uh, north of Point Conception. Um, those are not going to be fixed units. In the North Sea, you go to the North Sea and the, the uh, units are on monopoles. They're basically on pilings. Here, it's gonna to be too deep. So they're going to be, anchor, they're going to be drifting and, and anchored on tethers. They're not gonna go anywhere, but they're not gonna go, the structure itself is not gonna go all the way down the bottom. So from platforms, we, we get a sense of, well, what lives in the top 100 feet or 50 feet? So, so you can probably transfer that information to what's going to live uh, uh, under in the top 50 feet or however deep these things go. You can transfer that information to, uh, to that kind of renewable. If, on the other hand, uh, you decide that you can do wave energy in the channel, and that's going to be with some kind of fixed structure, then um, you can uh, directly extrapolate. Well, here's what lived on platforms in that area, and here we have a new fixed structure that's doing something different. You can uh, you can go uh, almost one to one probably in in, in hypothesizing. Great. I'm going to ask a few more questions for those of you. 
again, reminder that if I don't get to your question, um, Dr. Love has provided his email graciously and you can send it his way. Oh, um, absolutely. Uh, two things before we... Yeah. Next question. Number one is uh, only my wife calls me Dr. Love. So you should probably call me Milton. She'll be offended and uh, or suspicious. And uh, <laughs> the the other thing is, I forgot what the other thing was. Oh, oh, the other thing is, yes, uh, uh, do email me because I just have no life. I just sit here with my hands folded, uh, you know, waiting for someone to remember me. You know, you get get to a certain age and no one remembers you. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, next question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Peter wants to know, have similar- well, All these people, are... by the way, only have a first name. Yeah. Can we, can we buy them another name? I feel bad that- go Again, ahead. that's gonna require another endowment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Peter, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Peter wants to know, have similar platform fish studies been done in the Atlantic Ocean coastal areas? And if so, how do the results uh, compare to your Pacific Ocean coastal platform studies? Great question. Okay, on the Atlantic, there's almost no platforms. Um, there are platforms off of Canada, but essentially no platforms off of uh, North Carolina, places like that. Um, there are, as, as I've said, like thousands of them in the Gulf of Mexico, but that's a tropical system. More to the point, there are a bunch of them in the North Sea, again, fairly shallow, temperate uh, community. And um, there's been almost no fish studies ever in the North Sea. One of the things that prevents it is that uh, OSPAR, which is kind of the overarching set of regulations that the, um, uh, that the EU has about platforms, OSPAR says that a platform has to be removed except under exceptional circumstances, no matter what. They're gonna relook at OSPAR, but um, so because you have that kind of draconian set of regulations, the, the uh, impetus to study, well, what are platforms doing? Uh, you know, people, governments don't wanna pay for it because almost certainly they're gonna remove the platform anyway. So uh, until recently, nobody has done any study like that. That's fascinating. <laughs> um, Georgia wants to know, are the platform communities more or less resilient to disturbances from El Nino cycles that kelp forest communities may or may not be? Right. So um, well, often during El Ninos, as the, the question is phrased, uh, you find a dieback of kelp. And then animals that are associated with kelp, um, that I'm not a kelp, I'm not a, a kelp ed ecologist, but animals that are associated with kelp, when kelp dies back, that's not a good thing. Um, natural reefs that have no kelp during El Ninos and platforms that have no kelp during El Ninos, they, they seem to fare pretty well. The, the, the biggest thing we see during El Ninos is that survivorship of young fish, of young temperate fish, colder water fish, um, uh, such as rock fishes, uh, uh, during El Ninos, either on uh, uh, natural reefs or on platforms, there's very little survivorship because uh, during El Nino years, these fish drift around in uh, water that has very little plankton. Uh, uh, they get uh, predated upon very much more easily. And so uh, you, you tend to see very poor recruitment of young fish during El Ninos. And as soon as the El Nino is over, quite often you, uh, you get uh, a very good recruitment in following uh, years. But um, yeah, I mean, they're more resilient because you don't have this dieback of your substrate, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. Are you ready? Emotionally, I am prepared. Okay. Um, someone going by the initials BF um, wants to know, what's your favorite fish right now? Right now? Mm -hmm. As we just said, my favorite fish. Okay. I mentioned I have a tattoo of a cow cod, uh, which is one of my favorite fish. But my all-time favorite fish, which I also have a tattoo of, is of a deepwater angler fish. And the reason I have a tattoo of a deepwater angler fish, they live in, th th this particular species lives maybe 5,000 feet down. And it has a little lure that glows in the dark and brings in 
of prey, and that's very cool. But what's really cool is in this species, um, the males are parasitic on the females. They start out life as separate fish, we think, and then um, the, the males, their nostrils are huge, like they're picking up a scent. And we think the female, mature females, lay down a, a hormonal, pheromonal trail, and the little juvenile swims up it and it bites her right by the vent on the underside. And in one of the species, it basically disintegrates, the male does. Uh, the, the female circulatory system uh, breaks in and you're left with not much more than a little sack of sperm. So the, the, the fish is actually a sexual parasite on, uh, on the female. And um, uh, that's my goal in life actually is, is to do that. And, and I keep mentioning that to, to Jane and she just goes ah, like that. That's the, the reason people should have significant others is to ground one. I remember that um, uh, when I won the Carl L. Sullivan Conservation Award, which I had never heard of before, uh, the people at the American Fisheries Society, they emailed me and uh, they, they said, you won the award. And I went, okay, fine. And they said, come to San Francisco and pick it up. I went, okay, fine. And uh, uh, I went home and I said, I won the Carl L. Sullivan Award. And, and Janie said, you forgot to take the trash out this morning. And I'm going like, this is why it's important to have significant others in your life so you don't get a, a swelled head. Yeah, this, uh, this sounds very familiar. It rings very true for me as well. That's I, hope, <laughs> I hope you take the trash out tonight when you get home. You probably are home now that I'm thinking about it. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, well, well, this has been jolly. I mean, again, it's very so strange, much. but uh, jolly nonetheless. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Milton, um, and all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we hope to see you all on February 14th for our next Science Pub from Home, Global Conservation Impacts Through Local Leadership, Collaboration, Community, and Culture with Michelle Paddock, PhD. I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope to see you all there. Um, everybody have a great night. Stay safe, and we'll see you around. Bye-bye.